All right, folks, uh, thanks for joining us uh, today. I'm uh, Chris Christodoulou. I'm going to be talking about Alzheimer's disease, and um, this is the COVID-19 edition. <laughs> so I'm a neuropsychologist. I'm at the Center of Excellence for Alzheimer's Disease at, at, at Stony Brook, and um, I'm going to be talking to you about Alzheimer's disease and um, kind of relating a, a little bit of that to how things have changed, how, how they change for all of us, but also for uh, folks who are cognitively uh, vulnerable um, and who may have dementia or thing, something we'll discuss called mild cognitive impairment, how that might make things particularly difficult for them and, uh, and then what we can do to keep ourselves healthy. So uh, with that, I'll get started. So yes, I said I was part of the um, uh, of the CAD at Stony Brook, and our our goal is to um, do educational um, programs like this um, and to act as a resource for Suffolk and Nassau County healthcare providers and to try to um, provide increased access to screening, diagnosis, and treatment for patients and their families, and. Um, we, uh, you know, refer folks to people who are close to them. So some of you are a little further out on the island. And so we would always be looking to try to refer you to um, uh, local providers or wherever you, it is you want to go. Okay. So um, dementia is really a global as well as a local problem. Um, there are over um, uh, there are close to 50 million people around the world who have uh, some form of dementia. Uh, right here on Long Island, it's over 54,000. Um, and we spend a tremendous amount of money, um, close to a trillion dollars a year. Um, here in the United States, we spend about a quarter of a trillion dollars, more than that, actually. And that doesn't include all of the free care uh, that is provided to, um, to affected folks by family and friends and those, those people who care about um, the affected individual. And um, that amounts to another quarter of a trillion dollars a year here in the United States. So it's a tremendous problem. It's a huge amount of money, maybe not as huge as we might have thought now that we're spending so much and, and having such a large effect in our economy due to this uh, COVID pandemic, um, but it's still a, a huge amount of money. Um, so dementia is a general term. I want to make that clear to you. It, dementia is a general term for when um, someone shows a long-term and often gradual decrease in their ability to think and remember. And it becomes great enough that it interferes with that person's ability to function in their daily lives, in their social and occupational activities of daily living. Some people have problems thinking and remembering, thinking and or remembering, but um, their ability to carry out their daily activities is not um, affected uh, uh, drastically. It's relatively preserved. And those people, we give the label of mild cognitive impairment, or sometimes we say MCI. And both of these can result from a variety of brain diseases. So dementia is not a single disease. It's a variety, it can result from a variety of diseases, as can um, mild cognitive impairment. And these um, um, uh, disorders generally affect people who are older, 65 years of age and older, although they can affect uh, folks who are younger than that. So as I mentioned, dementia is this general term. It's an umbrella term. Both MCI and dementia are umbrella terms, and they can be caused by different diseases. And Alzheimer's disease is one of those diseases, but it's not the only one. Dementia with Lewy bodies is another one. Uh, vascular dementia caused by different um, types of uh, changes due to strokes, small or large strokes. Um, frontotemporal dementia. All of these are different kinds of diseases that can lead to a dementia. Um, but I'm going to focus mostly on Alzheimer's disease um, here today. So um, there can be many causes of cognitive, de cognitive decline, especially in older folks. So uh, it could be a vitamin deficiency. It could be um, uh, uh, changes in, the, in thyroid, a hypothyroidism, we call it. It could be due to infections. Sometimes UTI, urinary tract infections, can lead to cognitive changes. Sometimes people who are dehydrated um, uh, have altered cognition. And sometimes the medicines that um, people take, especially older folks who are on lots of medicines, um, the medicines that they are taking for these other conditions can sometimes have side effects uh, that impact their ability to think and remember. So um, medications that uh, impact uh, 
uh, acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter in the brain, can um, lead to side effects that affect memory. Benzodiazepines, things like Valium and stuff, can, can impact the ability of someone to learn new information and to remember that. Um, all of those things are reversible, but there are, are these other neurodegenerative illnesses that we don't have a cure for as of yet. Um, these are irreversible, and they include Alzheimer's disease and some of those other dementias that I mentioned to you. So um, Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. It affects about three quarters of those who have dementia in the older population. It's an irreversible, progressive, and it's ultimately a fatal brain disorder. Slowly uh, destroys memory and thinking skills and the ability to carry out even simple tasks. It's not a normal part of aging, okay? But the risks of Alzheimer's and risks of some of these other uh, neurodegenerative illnesses increase with age. And so in folks who are uh, in, the, in the range from 65 to 74 years of age, um, it's about 3%, but it rises to above 30% in those who are 85 years old or older. Excuse me. So in Alzheimer's disease, in this specific disease, there are two abnormal structures that we know about that are suspects in uh, what is causing the damage to the brain and what is what has caused the disease in the first place. There are amyloid plaques that occur in between the... Um, the nerve cells, the neurons, and there are uh, neurofibrillary, and there, and there are um, uh, tau tangles that occur inside the cells themselves. And um, we're not exactly sure uh, whether these are the causes of the disease or something that the disease causes, but these are our, our prime suspects now, and, and a lot of the, the um, clinical trials to try to treat. Um, uh, Alzheimer's disease are looking to impact the one of the one or the other of these two um, abnormal proteins. So um, a lot of people worry um, about. Uh, whether they're going to have Alzheimer's disease if someone else in their family has it. So it's a common question. So I just want to mention that um, there are different forms of Alzheimer's. Um, and there's an early onset form that tends to occur in folks who are younger than 65 years of age. And there are certain genetic mutations that make it very, very likely that someone will um, uh, have this early onset form. But the early onset form only accounts for a very few of the actual cases um, of Alzheimer's disease. The vast majority, or uh, 99%, have this other regular, or what we call late onset form of Alzheimer's. And there, the genetic link is not nearly as strong. There are some genes that can increase your risk, and having a family member can increase your risk to some degree, but it's not nearly as strong. Um, and there are um, lifestyle changes that I'll talk about that may help, um, uh, particularly help um, people who have these uh, genetic vulnerabilities. Um, so the problem in trying to understand if someone is declining cognitively, if they are having problems thinking that are worse than they used to be, is that a lot of people think that their um, thinking and, and or their memory is worse than it used to be and that it's impacting them. Um, so 11% of New Yorkers who are 45 years old or older think that they're experiencing this sort of thing and not nearly, you know, only a small fraction of those folks have mild cognitive impairment or, uh, or a dementia. Um, so the question is, you know, how do you uh, tell the difference between what's normal aging and what's not? And so there are some changes that take place with normal aging. So first I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the brain and how um, it works and, um, and how things change as we age. And so we can think about the brain as dealing with two big questions, okay? First, what is salient or, or what's important to me, right? And then the other thing is how to deal with it. Just because you know what's important doesn't mean you know what to, what to do about it, right? So if you see, uh, if you, you want an apple, but you can't quite reach the apple, you know, you need a ladder, you need a tool, you, you, you figure out how it is that you're going to get that thing or how to get away from the bad thing, right? So you... you um, have to deal with both of those issues, the what's important, and then 
how to deal with it. And um, um, the brain is built uh, to, add, to answer those two separate questions and, and integrate um, uh, our ability to, to take into account both. So what happens in our brains is that um, uh, initially everything is just brand new. So when we view a situation, normally we take into account our past information um, in order to predict what's going to happen and then sometimes we're surprised, right? Well, babies, you know, people with very little prior information, for them, everything is new. It's all kind of weird and wonderful. Sometimes it's a little scary, right? But um, as we get older, um, we, we develop the blessing of aging, right? Which includes some, hopefully, some wisdom, at least some expertise, some familiarity with the... Um, situations that we have experience with, right? So we learn what has worked in the past, worked well enough to keep us alive this long, right? Um, but the curse of aging is that things quite aren't quite as fresh as they used to be. So it's that same old, same old, oh, I've seen that before, it's not as important. So the new information coming in isn't as powerful, doesn't have as powerful effect on, an effect on us as it did when we were younger. And we are also a little um, less flexible, right? So we have all that wisdom, we have all that information, but it's harder to add new information into um, those routines that we've already developed. So um, what happens with normal aging is that this crystallized knowledge, this wisdom, this expertise that we have developed, that stays relatively stable. Um, but what does decrease is our cognitive flexibility and our fluid reasoning, ability to think on our feet in new situations and take in new um, information into our into account. So our ability to pay attention over a long period of time uh, decreases, our ability to pay attention to one thing when we're distracted by other stuff um, declines, our ability to process information, new information especially quickly declines, our ability to learn new information and hold on to it um, declines. But the information that's already in there, that's already in our long-term memory, that's relatively stable. And so in this graph, you can see all of that um, speed of information. So uh, the, you see that there's there, these lines. One set of lines is going down, and one is kind of stable. The one that's stable is our world knowledge. This is all the things that we've learned over the course of our lifetime that are, that are in there, and they're firmly in there. They are crystallized. Um, but all the other stuff, the speed of information processing, working memory, which just refers to attention, and long-term memory, which is really taking in new information and trying to get it into long term memory, all of that declines normally as we get older to some degree or, or, or another and some people don't decline as much but on average this is what happens. So over time we become creatures of habit, all of us, we, you know, because we have the same, we see the same situations over and over again and we tend to behave similarly it, when in those situations when they're repeated, right? So um, uh, well, one study said that about 35 to 40 percent of what we do in our daily lives is ha habitual, all right? But here we are in the age of coronavirus. So all of those things um, are going to work, are driving, are interacting with other people, our sleep schedules, our um, everything, our ability to find food, and, 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 and so forth, is all changed, right? And so all of these habits are impacted and we're all having to learn new information. That's hard for all of us, especially as we get older, but it's, um, uh, and it, it's also um, disproportionately a problem for people who have uh, dementias or mild cognitive impairment. So, you know, coronavirus, as I mentioned, it's destabilizing, right? So, you know, what's important? You know, who would have thought a few months ago toilet paper was so important? Or maybe, you know, now maybe maybe the toilet paper issue is out of date. Maybe that, you know, that was a few couple months ago toilet paper was impossible to find. Maybe not so much now. So we don't know what this new normal is, and we're having to deal with that unpredictability, and that's what's difficult. Um, so, um, you know, 
toilet paper, right? So knowing that you need the toilet paper is different from finding the toilet paper and getting the toilet paper, right? And so um, you have to deal with both with what's important, but also how to get it and where to find it in the world. And so those are those two things that I met, the two distinctions that I made, the, the what versus the where, how, um, where, how kind of goes together and what is separate. So um, what we try to do when we um, uh, see folks around us who we may be wondering if they're having, if they're experiencing some sort of um, uh, cognitive decline is that um, we uh, try to look for changes that have taken place and we try to distinguish those changes from what, um, from normal aging and, um, and so uh, here are some early signs, but you have to consider that um, what's normal now has changed, again, because of this coronavirus. So uh, the signs that you're looking for are uh, memory loss for new information that is uh, disrupting daily life. And so, you know, one of the common um, um, uh, presentations of this is, is that people um, with Alzheimer's disease or, or mild cognitive impairment may often... Um, ask the same questions over and over again or repeat the same things over and over again. Sometimes it's because they don't remember that they have said this before. Sometimes they don't remember that what the answer to their question that you gave them was before. Um, but these are uh, this kind of repetition is one of the things that we, you can look for. Um, confusion with time or place is an issue, but, you know, in these days of COVID-19, you know, we're all a little confused about what day it is, right? They, they talk about Blur's Day, right? I don't know if you've heard that term, Blur's Day, but the days are a blur. They, uh, we don't know whether it's Monday or Tuesday or Thursday or Friday or whatever it is. Um, but being confused about the day is different from being confused about the season or the year or the month. Um, if you're unable to keep up with that, you really your 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 ability to hold on to new information is really declining. Um, there's sometimes there are problems that you see early on in um, in speaking or writing. Sometimes it's problems with um, uh, understanding what it is that you see. Um, sometimes it, there are changes in in uh, judgment. Um, sometimes people are are um, subject to to these scams either on the computer or over the phone, um, which can be really a problem. Um, sometimes the the signs that people show are are more like um, a depression or, or some sort of a mood disorder. So they may withdraw from work or social activities. But in the age of, of COVID-19, you know, a lot of our work and our social activities have changed, right? Our ability to interact in person with, with, with people socially, obviously, has changed. The changes in mood or personality can take place. But again, it's hard to tell it, here in COVID-19 um, times um, what what is causing that, right? Um, sometimes people will um, misplace items and lose their ability to retrace their steps. Um, you know, we all occasionally forget where we put our keys or, or things like that. But when we start to find objects in unusual places, like our glasses end up in the refrigerator, that's a more serious, um, a more serious thing. Um, and sometimes people will have problems with um, planning or solving problems or difficulty completing uh, familiar tasks. So these are all signs to look for. None of these is a sure thing. That is, if you've experienced or you've seen someone who's experienced any one of these things, that may not be a big deal. But if people are showing multiple um, aspects of these and not just on a, on a on one-time basis or a very rare basis, but it's becoming more common, then it, it may be uh, something to look at and to have evaluated. So, um, Alzheimer's disease at this point, as I mentioned, we don't have a cure for Alzheimer's. We wish that we did, but we don't. The medications that we have can um, uh, it temporarily improve symptoms, but they don't um, stop the damage to the brain that is occurring. Um, and so we are still in the process of, of looking um, in research for, for that, that sort of an answer. But... Um, uh, 
there are a number of things that we can do to prevent and to improve quality of life and to um, and even in folks who have um, these disorders to slow down the the decline the progressive decline so I'm going to talk about some of those things now okay so um, oh I wanted to mention and I'm sorry I didn't do that before <laughs> maybe it's my Alzheimer's kicking in but um, I'll take questions. Uh, if you have a question, you can just put it into the chat room, and then at the end of the talk, I'll be uh, happy to answer that, answer those for you. Okay. So I'm showing you here this this figure um, that came from a review of all the things that people can do to prevent or things that are related to um, uh, to dementias. And um, so uh, they start from sort of early life at the beginning, um, and, and less education early in life is a risk factor. So getting more education is helpful. Um, in middle age, one of the things that is striking that came out that we weren't so, we didn't focus on so much before, but maybe we should, um, is hearing loss. So hearing loss in middle age is um, a, a, a problem and a um, predictor of cognitive decline. Um, we don't know whether it is... Um, it causes the cognitive decline. Um, you know, one of the hypotheses is that maybe it's use it or lose it because so much of the information we get in the, wor in the world comes through language that if we're not hearing things appropriately and we're not engaging in conversation and interacting it, we're losing those abilities and it, and it, and it may hasten um, uh, some sort of cognitive decline. We don't know that for sure, but, um, you know, we, we are, are, don't have a problem, you know, wearing glasses to improve our vision but um, if we um, dealt with hearing problems in the same way and, and got those treated early on, it might make a big difference. Um, the other thing I'll highlight is smoking. Smoking is bad for everything and every aspect of your health um, in the long run. Um, the, the problem is that smoking um, uh, in the short term can help improve focus. That's one of the one of the draws, one of the addictive qualities of it, um, it to, to, to younger folks. But then over time, smoking is just horrible for the brain as well as for the rest of your health. Um, and we'll talk about some of these other factors as we go along. So I mentioned um, education. So the fact that um, you guys are listening to this, you know, maybe we're, we're all, and that I'm doing this, maybe we're all delaying our uh, cognitive decline by a little bit. You know, this is educational. Um, any type of, um, you know, higher levels of education or occupation, leisure pursuits, playing Sudoku. Sudoku, um, you know, doing stuff on the computer, all these things um, may have some effect. The um, uh, evidence for uh, these uh, computer-based um, games that people play is not really strong yet, but you know, they're, they're certainly, uh, certainly fine. I would suggest if there's something that you, you know, uh, want to learn, that it's good to continue to learn things, but to focus on what it is you want to learn, on, on something that's important to you. If you've always wanted to play a musical instrument, fine, you know, try to do that. If you've always wanted to learn a second language, great, you know, you can, you can try that, but do something that has an interest for you, not just something that you think is exercise for your brain, okay? And it's more likely to work, in, in fact, because you're more likely to stay with it, and that emotional component, that that buzz that you get from doing something that you want well um, will um, will be better for your brain. Um, the other thing um, uh, that we look at as a risk factor for cognitive decline is sleep disturbance, um, and so um, uh, you know sleep disturbance can include insomnia, difficulty you know falling asleep or staying asleep. It can also uh, include sleep di disordered breathing, uh, something we call sleep apnea. So um, uh, people who have sleep apnea actually stop breathing while they're asleep for short periods of time, but that's bad. <laughs> you know, it's not just bad for your general health, but it's bad for your brain and then therefore bad for your ability to think and remember. So your brain is only three pounds. That's not very much in terms of the whole percentage of our body weight, obviously, but our brain uses about 
a, a quarter, uh, a fifth to a quarter, 20 to 25 percent of all the energy that we uh, take in. And a lot of that, ener that energy consists of oxygen and glucose. So the fuel is, 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 um, is, is glucose, you know, the sugar that we take in from the food that we get. But um, the, the, the oxygen is, is necessary, just like for an, en you know, an, an internal combustion engine. So um, not breathing is bad for your brain. Sleep apnea is treatable. There are devices that you can wear, um, some that help you get more oxygen in, some that, that um, alter the placement of your jaw that, that can sort of open up those airways and make it easier for you to breathe. Um, and um, so it's, it's something that you should take into account. Now, the issue here with COVID is that um, sleep has been impacted by that as well, right? So people's uh, work schedules and sleep schedules uh, have been changed by this. And um, so there's anecdotal evidence that people are uh, have experiencing more vivid dreams, sometimes more scary dreams. Um, and we don't know exactly what that's related to, but... Um, you know, uh, in general, uh, we have more of our dreams later on in the evening and closer to morning. And so if we're sleeping a little bit later, we may be having more dreams and therefore maybe remembering more of those dreams um, when, we w when we wake up. And um, so um, what you can... what what. We can suggest for all of us is to try to have a, uh, a is to practice good sleep hygiene, and that means kind of trying to structure our sleep schedules to wake up at the same time and go to bed at the same time, and to um, use the bed just for sleeping and um, and you know, maybe something else that you have in mind, but um, uh, not for uh, watching TV or doing other kinds of activities, so that um, you develop sort of good sleep hygiene. So it's a, it's um, reest establishing some structure um, that, that may be helpful. Um, so social interaction is also very important. People who um, have more social interaction, more so social participation, increased frequency of social contact, they tend to do better over the long run. Again, we don't know whether that causes better um, um, thinking down the line, but interacting with other people very well could do that, right? Because it, it, it's cognitively demanding and cognitively challenging uh, to, to deal with other people. And so, um, and unfortunately, you know, COVID is affecting that as well now, right? Our ability to at least, um, 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 uh, you know, physically interact with other people is, is more limited under the, under the conditions of, of COVID now. But um, there are ways, you know, through Zoom and all these other technologies that we can try to do that. And, you know, we have to try to adapt because social interaction is really important to our, our mental health, also to our general health um, in ways that we are um, learning more and more about. And so it's important to try to um, um, remain in contact with the people that you love and that you uh, like interacting with. Um, another risk factor um, is depression and, and, and um, negative mood. Now, the relationship between depression and dementia is not completely understood. There, just because you have depression doesn't mean you can't have dementia at the same time. So just because you have dementia doesn't mean you can't have depression. You can have both. And having depression does increase your risk later on of, of having dementia. But it's not a sure thing. And uh, treating the depression can improve a person's ability to think and to remember. Um, so um, when we are depressed, we often have trouble with what's called effortful thinking. Doing anything that involves effort, but thinking that involves effort. Thinking that is not sort of automatic. That's the, the effortful kinds of thinking where we have to try to learn new information. That particularly affected by, um, by depression. And so if you can treat the depression, you can sometimes improve a person's ability to think um, whether or not they have dementia or whether or not there's any increased risk of that. Um, when we think about trying to prevent um, uh, dementias or, or, or you know, cognitive decline in general, we can think about these, these three concentric circles um, where um, you know, we can think about increased cognitive reserve, and we talked about some things that can impact that, like education, um, cognitive training, uh, preserving your hearing, right? Um, 
We've talked about um, we've talked about the brain needing all of that oxygen and glucose, right? And and so the brain is a, a mechanical device to to a degree. We can think of it in that way, and um, we need it to be working in tip top shape. And what that means is that we need to take care of the blood vessels that provide um, that energy to the brain, and we need to um, deal with things like cardiovascular issues, like high blood pressure and high cholesterol um, that can uh, interfere with um, uh, the ability of uh, 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 interfere with that, our cardiovascular system that provides all that blood into the brain. And the other thing is metabolic disorders like diabetes, um, which can also affect the quality of the um, fuel that makes it into the brain. And we can also talk about uh, reduced brain inflammation. Um, and there, um, uh, you see a couple of things, um, but in the middle, sort of in the middle of all of this, is exercise and adherence to a Mediterranean diet. So I'm going to talk about those two things uh, as they're very important. And exercise is really at the middle of all of these things. It seems to impact uh, cognitive reserve. It, re it helps reduce brain damage. And it also reduces inflammation. So let's look at that. So um, uh, it... We know that when we exercise uh, in the short term, you know, we might experience some muscle soreness um, uh, for, you know, for a short period of time. Um, and that is caused by some inflammation, right? But that's short-term acute inflammation. What exercise does over the long run is reduces chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation is a, is a problem we are now seeing for so many of the um, uh, illnesses that, that people experience, um, including neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's, like Lewy body dementia, like all these um, diseases of the brain. Um, inflammation is, be, is increasingly being seen as, as, as a uh, causal or a correlated factor. It seems to be involved somehow. And so exercise reduces that. Um, and the other thing is that, um, that um, exercise can help the brain grow. Now, when we, until 20, 30 years ago, we didn't think that we could do anything to regenerate our brain or to um, uh, change the, you know, the brains that we were born with, right? Um, but it turns out we can. It turns out we do. Uh, our brain is continually creating these new brain cells, um, and... Um, uh, and they're created in, in, in places in, the, in old areas of the brain, like the hippocampus, that's important for new learning and memory. And one of the things that we can do to increase that rate of uh, new brain cell growth is exercise. Um, and so that's, again, another route and another reason um, um, that exercise is important. And... Um, just to pound home the issue a little bit more, there have been many, many studies now that have looked at exercise. So all of these things in this table here, um, many, many studies have shown that exercise, especially aerobic exercise, so aerobic exercise is anything that gets your heart rate increasing, gets your breathing just a little bit heavier than you would normally, that's aerobic exercise, and anything that includes aerobic exercise appears to be beneficial um, and, it, and the effect of it um, uh, is that it, in, it tends to improve or, or slow cognitive decline, not only in people who are vulnerable to, who, not only in regular older folks who are at, at risk for, for, uh, a, a, for dementia and other things, but also in people who have Alzheimer's itself or who have mild cognitive impairment. They also benefit from this. Their cognition, their ability to think and remember is, is better um, because they have participated in regular exercise. So I would encourage anybody to do that and um, to start you know, from wherever you are and just do a little bit more. And the best things to do if you can are to um, try to do things on a regular basis, things that you might like to do. Like if walking is your thing, that's fine. Dancing, you know, anything that you like. Uh, you're more likely to do regularly if you can find some um, somebody to do it with. You know that can sometimes be helpful. But in any case, try to br build some structure here. And again, it's more difficult in this time of COVID. But 
Um, they're all online. Um, now lots of online exercise um, things are, that are out there and available. Um, and what I'll, and um, at the very end of this, you can see uh, the contact for our, for our CAD, for the CAD Long Island, and um, we'd be happy to help you find some of these resources that you can use, okay? Um, so the other thing that I'll focus on now is, is a healthy diet. And um, the Mediterranean diet, so my last name is Chris Tadulu, right? So I, I'm, uh, my, my family's straight off the boat uh, from, from one of these areas, and from Cyprus. And, and um, so I grew up, whether I liked it or not, with this Mediterranean diet, and I like it. Um, it involves eating lots of fruit and vegetables and nuts and, and whole grains, a little more fish, a little less red meat, lots of spices in addition to salt or so that you don't need quite as much salt to, to give your, your food its flavor. Um, uh, healthy fats like um, olive oil instead of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, meat-based um, um, uh, uh, oils. So um, these are all things that are, go into this uh, Mediterranean diet. And um, the DASH diet, this dietary approach is to stop hypertension, is very similar. And it, um, it also, but it also emphasizes lowering sodium, which is especially important in people with high blood pressure and who have cardiovascular issues. Um, so there was a study. It's hard, really hard to do these kinds of studies because you have to get people to eat what you want them to eat over a long period of time. And that's not easy to do. But there was a good study that was done in Barcelona over a four-year period where they gave one group of people um, olive oil. Um, they gave another group of people mixed nuts. So olive oil and mixed nuts are two important parts of a Mediterranean diet. And the other group, they just said try to eat healthy, but they didn't really give them much in the way of recommendations. And those two groups that got the olive oil or got the mixed nuts tended to do better on uh, tests of cognition, on thinking and remembering tests um, after a four-year period. Um, and so, you know, that's good evidence for that. Now, these were not people who already had dementia, but um, still, it, 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 it's a, a, a useful study. Um, the other thing that, uh, that I'll ask you to keep in mind is that um, doing all of these things, you don't have to just do one of them, right? The more you do, the better. And so there was a study out of Finland, um, um, uh, the, the, the Finnish uh, study that looked at, at the impact of exercise and diet and cognitive training like computer games and treating high blood pressure and, and uh, reducing uh, uh, BMI or uh, um, uh, you know, weight, and uh, all of this combination of things over a two-year period also improved overall cognition. Um, so um, what we hope for in the future is to be able to treat these kinds of illnesses like Alzheimer's and other forms of, of dementia as uh, chronic diseases. Um, identify them early on through biomarkers, in, perhaps in the blood or, the, or, or through new forms of brain imaging, to allow us with, to have earlier and more accurate diagnosis. And then to ultimately treat them like we treat other chronic diseases, like cardiovascular diseases and diabetes, before the disability occurs um, to um, sort of help folks the most. Um, so as I mentioned, um, here's some information on contacting us at the, at the CAD. Our website has some of these um, resources available, but you can call us and um, uh, folks at, at our center would be happy to help you. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Um, let me see here. Uh, yeah, more chat. Okay. Great. Okay. So, um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, I, I've opened up the chat room. Um, you know, maybe everything was really clear, which I'm happy about. But if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those too. Uh, so just let me know. Uh, otherwise, it was a pleasure uh, to to be with you, even though it was virtually. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to, uh, and we at the CED would be happy to um, talk with you and, and help more in the future.
Okay. Um, all right, so we, I'm just trying to read this here. Uh, we tried some medication for my dad that ended up making him feel worse. We are at a loss and heard from a friend who tried CBD. Any thoughts? Okay, well, um, you know, um, you know, these are uh, cannabinoid, um, um, uh, you know, drugs that are sort of based on marijuana, um, uh, one, you know, one of the major substances in marijuana. And for a very long time, um, the government would not allow, or at least made it extremely difficult to do research on uh, marijuana and other kinds of, you know, what they call illicit drugs. And so um, it's hard to know exactly what it is good for. There's certainly anecdotal um, advice, uh, anecdotal, um, um, you know, we hear anecdotes about people who responded well, but we don't really know. The research really isn't there. And um, uh, so I, I can't give you any, any firm advice on that, unfortunately. Uh, anything else? All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It was it was a pleasure. I uh, uh, wish you all the best. Um, wish us all the best in dealing with uh, with this new normal, whatever it is. And um, uh, you know, thanks for attending today. Okay. Take care. And uh, I want to say a big uh, shout out and thank you to, to Brooke Oliveri for helping organize all of this. Um, it really wouldn't have worked without you, uh, Brooke. And I appreciate it and I'm happy to talk to you guys anytime. Okay, bye-bye.